namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa aparuta de sangamata satavara Ye sodavanta bamunjan tu satang. So listening to the silence, silence is the background for all the noise and sounds, both externally and internally. But it's always here and now. So I remember early years of my monastic life, just realizing silence as a refuge. And I used to fill notebooks with just writing silence, the word silence in English. So it's like a reminding myself of the noise that is the world that we experience through the senses. So the world that we experience through the senses is noisy. And it, uh, and that's what sensuality amounts to. Having eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, having a brain is this incessant thoughts, memories, sight, sound, smells, taste and touch. But behind all that, the sensory experiences that we experience, that we have through this form is the silence. So silence and space Space is where we manifest. So right now we're experiencing the manifestation of form in space. Just as we reflect and investigate Dhamma, because Dhamma is not a belief system. It's not about believing and uh, being loyal to teachings and and uh, being caught up in in trying to figure it out with thoughts because thoughts are manifestations in consciousness so dhamma which i Dhamma, which are investigation of the way it is, or Dhamma, or ultimate reality. And how can your intellect investigate ultimate reality? You know, it's a hopeless task. Because your intellect is, is, is a manifestation. All your thoughts your education, your emotions are all acquired experiences to, to, through this form that we identify with. So that, that misidentification, this identification with forms and ideas is the cause of suffering because we suffer 
because of this ignorance of vicha, ignorance of Dhamma. So Dhamma has no form. It doesn't manifest itself. It doesn't, it's not manifestation. It's not an experience. You can't experience Dhamma. You experience through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, pleasure and pain, etc., all the opposites, the dualities of, of the sensory experience. But Dhamma is apparent here and now and timeless. So my constant reminding you of this, because we chant this in the morning and evening pujas, apparent here and now and timeless. Now that's intellectual, that's words, trying to, you know, they're not describing Dhamma, they aren't saying it, what it looks like, or what it feels like, or what it sounds like, but it's apparent here and now and timeless. So these are ways of investigating. They're meant to investigate. Is this true or not? You know, what's apparent here and now? What do you think of the temple, the shrine? The monks, the nuns, the lay people, men, women, parent here and now. But these are forms that manifest in space. Space and consciousness. So in getting to the source of it all, the source is the Dhamma, what we in this particular tradition call Dhamma. So this encouragement to investigate is uh, very important to take seriously because uh, we we're quite we're conditioned to believe in things or disbelieve. So we believe in the, uh, in Buddha and or we don't believe in Buddha or you believe in God or you don't believe in God or. You have views and opinions, an atheist, there's no God. Science is, is my guru, my teacher. And so we, we acquire knowledge from modern science about the, the things that we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and think. We acquire that kind of knowledge So acquired knowledge is, it manifests. Where does it manifest? In consciousness. So getting back to the source, consciousness, what's the difference between Dhamma and consciousness? You know, is there a difference? And then we try to define that, you know, is do I take refuge in consciousness or in Dhamma or is there something higher than consciousness, superior to consciousness? And we get our mind confused because we, you know, we're trying to, to objectify, imagine something higher than consciousness or trying to define Dhamma so as some kind of thing that, that, you, that has qualities or conditions attached to it. So trying to figure out Dhamma through the intellect is not Dhamma Vichya, it's not investigating, it's just acquiring knowledge about Dhamma from texts, from teachers, from traditions. 
Not to condemn that, I'm not condemning that, but it is kind of missing the point when uh, the whole point of the Buddhist teaching is to find out for yourself. Because it's only through profound insight, jnana is the Pali word, Yana is insight into reality itself. And that insight into reality isn't, has no form. It's, uh, it's when you realize the attachments to the form conditions is the cause of suffering, then we, we have the insight into let go, let go of them. So what is, how can, how can uh, a form like our forms, monks, nuns, lay people, how can they realize the formless? You know, so we, we uh, very much identify with the form. We live in the form. We have to experience the form all the time. The, the pressures, the experiences through the senses, through the body, it's karma, things that happen, good or bad, right or wrong. And so the, the world is, is about right and wrong, good and bad, true and false, believing or disbelieving. And this is what, you know, when you listen to the news or the media of present time, it's all about views and opinions, the right, the left, the, how we define and divide everything into good and bad, right and wrong, left and right. <clears throat> because in terms of census, that's the experience we have through the senses. We experience pleasure, pain, good and bad, right and wrong, through the senses, through the conditioning of the mind. And then, but to, to try to figure that out with thoughts, with theories, with views and opinions, It's like, you know, it's like a dog chasing its tail. You go around in circles and you never quite get it. So, you know, in my experience, meeting people, Buddhists, who've been practicing meditation for years, and then say, you know, I've been practicing meditation for 20 years, 30 years, but I haven't had any profound insights, or I'm nowhere, I'm full of doubts. <clears throat> Which is because they, they, they've been caught in a belief system, believing that by meditating, that if I'm going to, me I've got to meditate in order to become enlightened as a person. So as a person, I've, I should meditate so many hours a day and, and, uh, and uh, try to get samadhi, try to realize the deathless, trying to become enlightened, I want to become enlightened. I want to get out of this realm of sangsara. You know, so these are thoughts that we, we create in our mind. But can a person, can a, th a thought condition personality ever become enlightened? 
you can think you're enlightened. You know, so you meet people who think they are enlightened. <clears throat> but is that enlightenment, just to believe that you, you as a person have achieved enlightenment? So this is, this is you know investigating the ident the the uh, obvious reason many of us come to ordain as monastics or come to meditation retreats is because we we want to get something we believe we don't have. <clears throat> we believe we're unenlightened and we've got to become enlightened. So investigating that, that belief, I am enlightened or I'm not enlightened. And by Dhamma Vichaya, in, instead of investigating it, you, you begin to see that it's just words. I am unenlightened, I've been practicing 20 years and I've gotten nowhere. I don't have enough samadhi. I don't think I can become enlightened in this life. These are, when we listen to these, these, this sense of me and mine, I'm not enlightened. What is aware of these thoughts? I am not enlightened. What is aware of that? Is that enlightened or not enlightened? So in emphasizing sati and dhamma vichaya, the first two factors of enlightenment, these are to investigate. So just the personal pronouns, I, me, mine, these are creations in consciousness, they arise and cease. Are you really an I, a separate person? Because everything, you, when you investigate your personality, Sakya Ditti, you begin to see it's very ephemeral, very unsteady. It changes very quickly according to conditions. So the condition realm is forever changing, it's impermanent. And so the personality, the, what you believe you are, you believe I'm unenlightened, it's still a belief. So it may be even true, uh, you know, the body, this body here isn't enlightened. You know, I, I as a person am unenlightened. My personality is not an enlightened personality. Because taking refuge in Dhamma, you're witnessing the personality as an object. The Bhutto, the, the Buddha knows Dhamma. So is Buddha some kind of imagined force in the universe? Is, is mindfulness, awareness, some kind of universal energy in the universe that we tune into? You know, so we can imagine, you know, the, it is a cosmic energy, uh, and these are still maybe very were, you know, intelligent ways of explaining it. But is that it? Just to, to form more views and opinions about whether you are enlightened or not enlightened or will ever get enlightened. Uh, 
So uh, this beginning to see the personality, listen to it. You're not getting rid of it. You're not trying to judge it, whether you have a good personality or a no personality or bad personalities are matters of other views and opinions, personal and from oneself or from others. But what is Sakya Ditti? What is the personality? So in investigating this, you you know, one looks at the personality very directly. Not judging it, it's not about trying to have improve my personality, but about observing personality, Sakya Ditti is like this. It manifests it and it disappears, demanifests, changes according to conditions. And who is the witness? What is the witness of this changing condition? Is it, a, is it, can one identify with it? Or is there no total unnecessity to identify with conscious awareness, with mindfulness? Because it's natural, it's not something created by your personality or by your beliefs. One can believe in mindfulness and awareness and all these are intellectual terms. We can believe I've got to be mindful, which is, is a fair enough, good belief, but it is a belief. What, what has to be mindful? Who has to be mindful? So you keep questioning. And mindfulness or conscious awareness is apparent here and now and timeless because, you know, it's, that's what we're, that's the reality that we all share, this conscious awareness here, consciousness here and now. Whether we're aware, you know, we think of consciousness as conscious of through the senses. So we think of eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness. But consciousness through the senses, you know, consciousness cannot think, has no language, has no form, has no preferences, and can only experience manifestations through the forms that manifest in consciousness. So these forms are manifestations in consciousness. And so that's the source, the consciousness is the source. But if we still operate in our meditation, our practice of Dhamma, with the idea I've got to get something or get rid of something, you know, investigate that. Who, who has to get rid of something or get something you don't have? What is it? You know, the personality is always kind of doubting, uncertain, blaming, feeling sorry for oneself, getting caught up in all the worldly dhammas, the taking sides with the right or the left, with the angels or the devils, you know, so we, you know, as a person, we, we're caught in the momentum of this uh, uh, relentless changingness. And it's unpredictable. 
Just like uh, right now in the media, there's so much uh, news about climate change. We're experiencing uh, the changingness of the climate that we're experiencing through the forms, through the senses. And what does that do to your personality? You know, when you think of the climate's going to get worse, it's uh, we're going to be, uh, you know, you imagine all kinds of horror scenarios in the future. It's going to change in a way that that isn't what we want. We d we want to keep the climate like it is. We don't want it to change. And that's the personality, that's how you're conditioned as a person to, to, see, to see the future as a threat, as a danger. Or if you're very optimistic, then you tend to see we all cooperate together and learn to live in harmony and, and help each other and be moral and kind and compassionate, then the future is, will be very wonderful because we'll, we'll be, have a United Nations uh, working together of all the nations on the planet, peacefully sharing knowledge and, and helping each other in times of need. And so this is a, 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 you know, a projection into the future about what we might hope for or long for as a person. But it's not Dhamma. It's not the way things are. The future, you know, this is, Dhamma is timeless. The future is all about time, what you imagine. So anything in the future is, can, you know, is uh, everything's going to get better and better or worse and worse is our images that we create in consciousness. They manifest through thoughts. They're thoughts that arise and cease. It's not that they're wrong thoughts. It's not about judging that. That it's wrong, but it is an illusion we create that create that uh, that when we cling to these illusions and we suffer, because the reality is here and now, timeless, that we all share. It's not something special like my reality is superior to yours. Because when I think like that, then, then it becomes personal again. So there's no person, separate person, that has any permanent qualities. You know, so, you know, the, even a, a very, what we call normal, stable, emotionally mature, a man or woman, you know, is still subject to COVID pandemics, to to old age, sickness, and death, to loss, to climate change, because that's the personality is very un, unstable. So what is stable? What is you can trust? What is our real refuge is in Dhamma, absolute reality, which is which we realize through conscious awareness here and now. So what is there to worry about when you realize your true nature is ultimate reality and what you think you are is is kind of temporary state of manifestation that is in the process of changing.
So there's, you know, ever since I remember, there's been doomsday scenarios become popular and common for periods of time. And, uh, you know, the, 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 what are doomsday scenarios in terms of here and now? They're imagined possible, miserable possibilities for the future. <clears throat> But here and now, when you abide in the present, the Santitiko Akalika Dhamma, then worry doesn't, can't manifest. But when you abide in your conditioning, your personality, your cultural conditioning, religious conditioning, then there is a lot to worry about. What's the future of Buddhism in the world? And in, uh, you know, is, is America a Christian country for white people or is it a democratic country for everyone, you know, so people have various views and opinions about what America is and democracy. Here in Britain, with its past, colonial past, now we have a Muslim mayor for London and a chancellor with Indian background, and recently a Muslim was elected Chancellor of Scotland, or Prime Minister, whatever they have. So then, you know, this it's quite interesting to see the karma of Britain having been a colonial power, going around influencing everybody uh, showing off power and and uh, having a superior attitude towards other powers, other nations. Because the consciousness is, is unitive. Whether you Muslim or Christian or Buddhist or Hindu, black or white, Jewish, whatever, these are mere acquired identities. They're not, they're not true, uh, true reality. So these identities then have their karma because the identification always singles you out. There's always an opposite to what you identify with. So as long as you identify with, with a religion, with, with a political system, with a racial prejudice, with, with anything at all, then that creates a sense of being threatened by those who d don't respect that. Just the problems between the sexes, men and women. You know, that that's, goes on a lot everywhere, between man and wife, male and female. Yeah. Because these identities are, you know, are what we cling to and we don't realize our true nature. So in the Buddhist, Buddhist teaching is an attempt to point, to, to investigate, to find out for yourself what, what, you're true, what you truly are. So by doing that, then you liberate yourself. You can live with the identities, the forms, the bodies, the karmic inheritance that individuals have. We can bear with that if we know our true nature. 
you know, we don't make a problem about the way we are, the, the, the body we have, the race we belong to, the religion, the, the, uh, sexual identities. We don't make problems about these kind of things because they're conditions. They're not what one truly is. So in the second noble truth, the uh, insight is to let go of conditions. And oftentimes this, this uh, letting go, this, these English words, you know, we've got to get rid of our personality. We've got to get rid of our prejudices, our beliefs, and and uh, our selfishness. We've got to get rid of, of uh, our fears and anger. So is, is letting go really just a, a form of annihilation? Or is it merely trusting in awareness, relaxing, trusting in, in awareness here and now, Learning to to, re to really recognize the silence that's ever here and now and present behind the noise that your mind makes, your emotions, the what you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, the climate change problems, the the wars, the the unfairness, the injustices. It doesn't mean that that we don't. Uh, can just live an indifferent life, but we're no longer caught in the belief, in the blind attachments to views and opinions. So each one of us has our own separate karma. So we, you know, as as manifestations, we're all different. So everyone sitting here in the sala is, is not two people the same. The monastics, they try to look the same by shaving their heads and wearing <laughs> robes. And <laughs> so that, that's, uh, that's what, is that the answer to it? Does everybody sh should shave their head and ordain as monks and nuns? And that's another view and opinion. And then somebody once asked me if, if every became, everyone became monks and nuns, who would feed us? <laughs> and I, I thought, oh, I'm not going to worry about that. <laughs> but that's what the imagination does. What if everybody on the planet became a monk or a nun? A Theravadan Buddhist, you know, one can, uh, and then we realize in Sangha life itself, here at Amavati, there's, there's communal problems, personality differences, views and opinions arise. And, uh, and so even when we try to de-emphasize the separateness, you know, and trying to create a sense of equality through believing in it, then we, uh, you know, we're not, we're trying to do this from the unenlightened, ignorant point of view, rather than from truly understanding one's true nature, which we all share, everybody. So just just uh, li listen to your you know don't be afraid to uh, 
think. Don't don't try to stop thinking as some kind of I've got to stop thinking, but listen, be the listener to the thinking process that we individually have in its various right and wrong manifestations in itself. Listen to selfishness. Listen to greed or anger, jealousy and fear. These are manifestations in consciousness. And when we try to resist them and fight them and hold on to the good and, and repress the bad, we're caught in the endless conflict, the wars of the mind, the wars of conditioned phenomena that, are, that have been going on ever since the phenomena appeared, manifested. Because the phenomena is going to, you know, because we are, the forms are all different. Then we we can't find equality in the forms. I can't make you think like I do. I can, you know, a, a dictatorship, an authoritarian system tries to, out of fear, make you believe the system that they're propounding so you know out of fear you kind of conform to the laws and regulations of society because we're personally afraid to break the law you get punished go to jail and so you know through through these kind of uh, methods of f frightening people, making them behave through fear, through social pressure. Is this wrong or right? Is that wrong to have, uh, to, to impose morality on people? to have just laws, democratic systems, is it, do we just discard all that and just believe in the present moment? But it's not like that. I mean, these are thoughts, Im Im images we create, or assumptions we make from the logic that we create with our thoughts. So just listening to this thought, I am enlightened, it comes and goes, doesn't it? Can you sustain that? I mean, you know, become obsessed with it. You can be, make yourself completely a complete nuisance by go around telling everybody you're enlightened or believing it yourself. And then the humility, you know, most of us subscribe to some form of humility, or I'm not enlightened. Let's say, and you've been a monk for 56 years already, and you're not enlightened, you've been wasting your life. But in the thought process, I am enlightened, I am not enlightened. These are, these are thoughts in English words that we use to describe ourselves. But we can listen to that. And that which listens to thoughts is not a thought, is not a person, is not a separate person. It's the gate to the deathless. The way we realize our true nature is the deathless reality of Dhamma. So, one person 
wrote me a letter saying that, implying you've got to crush your personality. You've got to get rid of it, crush it, disempower your personality. Or, from my experience, you know the personality is letting go of it. It's not getting rid of it or crushing it. Because if I, if I feel I must crush my personality, that's still the personality. How can my personality crush itself? Because those are kind of violent terms, to crush your personality, get rid of your personality, you know, is still sakyaditi. To get rid of anger, I've got to get rid of anger, I've got to be more humble, I've got to uh, practice more. These are, some of these are maybe good advice. But listen to them from the puto position, the witnessing position. Who has to crush the personality? Who's, or is the personality just some ephemeral experience of the moment, because it changes. Is anger really mine? Is it, when, when I experience anger, is it really what I am? Is it my anger? And I listen to that. My anger. And those words, my and anger, arise and cease. If I take the puto position of witnessing sankharas arising, ceasing, beginning and ending, being born and dying, what's left is a deathless reality of awareness, conscious awareness, consciousness or dhamma. When you get into consciousness, you can't define it, because that's what you are. You know, you can't find yourself because you are yourself. You're the awareness and the consciousness that's here, apparent here and now and timeless. What you are not is what you think and believe and feel. What you see, hear, smell, taste, touch. This is what you're not. This is all ephemeral conditions, rising and ceasing, manifesting, disappearing in consciousness. So as you take your stand with conscious awareness, then you find stability in that. It's, there's freedom from worry, anxiety, freedom from <clears throat> the aging, prob physical problems that we experience, the emotional problems. We begin to see our, our emotional problems, and we listen to them. That which is aware of anger or fear, resentment, is not an emotion. So this witnessing, and in these terms of puto, tamo, sanko, then that Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, these are, these are not belief words you grasp and believe in, but they're kind of skillful means to investigate the reality that we're experiencing, that what, what we experience through the senses and what's ultimately real. And so this is the liberation from the birth and death cycles that are just realms of fear and anxiety and tend to repeat themselves endlessly. So I offer this as a reflection. Um, my, uh, my, uh,